and welcome to mini episode 165 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And I have four spooky stories for you today. And the last story comes from the 24th of January 2022. And story number one comes from Mark. We lived in our old house for around five years. We moved into this house with one child and left with three. They were busy years. Our three children are girls and all I wanted was a boy. We should have just got some dogs. I'm joking, I love my girls, Rini. Our home was absolutely mental, but generally a happy family home. These incidents are very spaced out time-wise, and I could not say why things seem to occur so infrequently. The first things to seem a little strange were our middle daughter, the youngest at the time, used to have bad dreams about Mr. Tickle at around two years old. Both of our elder daughters have later said that they felt a hand on their back sometimes when they were sleeping. From how they described the action, it seemed like the hand was trying to be comforting as opposed to harmful. We didn't really think much of it and just thought it was children having funny dreams. One night I stirred and thought I saw our eldest daughter come into the room. She walked past my side of the bed and around to my wife's side. This was not unusual, so I closed my eyes. A couple of minutes later, I heard my wife react as she lifted her head and made a confused sound. I asked her what was up and she told me that she felt someone tap her but no one was there. I then thought of what I thought was my daughter coming into the room. I checked on the girls and they were fast asleep. I asked them in the morning and both had slept through the night. It did seem strange that I saw someone and she felt the touch. It verified that something was going on and it was impossible to ignore. A few months later, I had a very strange visitor at night. My daughters were between two and five at this time, so I was essentially a human climbing frame. I often used to lay on my front, and either girl would climb on my back and jump on me to attack. One night, I was asleep on my front in the standard climbing frame position. I felt a child slowly climb from down by my legs onto my back and lay there. I was asleep but this actually woke me up, but the feeling didn't stop. As I woke, I thought it might be one of the girls, but after a while the feeling faded. I went to move and nobody was on me, and once again, the girls were in bed. When I think about what happened, I get a combination of goosebumps and heebie-jeebies, but at the time I knew it was a child, and I felt zero threat. I was not scared, and that is the strangest part. I knew I had a little visitor that night, but when I was home alone later, I tried talking to it and offering to help it. I had no response to anything I asked. The last time I had my little visitor, it seemed to be in a more playful mood. I was asleep on my front again, and I felt something pushing up on the mattress from underneath the bed. It felt like feet pushing up, one foot, then the other, and then both together. It started as I slept but as I woke, it carried on. I lay still and just let it carry on as it felt like the visitor was trying to leg press me through the bed. I wanted to look under the bed, but some instinct told me not to. Again, I felt no threat, and bizarrely, my thoughts were that I didn't want to scare it. I knew it was a child. After probably five minutes, it stopped and I went back to sleep. The next day again, I invited it to come forward, but nothing. Our little visitor has not followed us to our new home. I believe Mr. Tickle or the visitor was a little girl who was attracted to our family and wanted to join in the fun. But we'll never know for sure. I think it's sweet that you established that it was a little girl ghost and that you didn't feel any negative energy from it and that it all felt okay. But Mr. Tickle is not a good name for anything. It's not a good name for a ghost, okay? It's got so many connotations. I I can imagine some horror film with a kid being like, Mr. Tickle came to visit my room last night. And let me tell you, that is not a sentence you ever want a child to say, horror film or otherwise. So I I just wish that your daughter had not named the entity in your house Mr. Tickle. And I think it would be very easy to dismiss all the sleep stuff. I know there's lots of people who like to dismiss things that happen at night time or when people are in bed immediately because they're like, well, you were asleep or nearly asleep or in bed, so you don't fully know how conscious you were at the time. But for you to see an entity or see what you thought was your daughter and then your wife to go, oh, I felt something. 
and there's nobody there it's very interesting and for your daughters to have the same experience of feeling somebody put their hand on their back at night time maybe it was a little girl ghost who just was saw a house full of girls and wanted to be a part of the family oh it's sweet but sad and story number two comes from katie in october of 2021 a friend of mine had to have emergency surgery and wound up being in the hospital for about a week one afternoon i went to take him some magazines and things he needed from home I stayed to chat for a while, and about ten minutes after I arrived, I heard the sound of a shower running from his bathroom. There was no one in there, so I assumed it was coming from the room next door. A few minutes went by, and I started to think that the shower had been going for an awfully long time. Then I noticed there was water all over the floor of the hospital room. I went into the bathroom and saw that it had been his shower that was on, and I had to turn the handle back to turn it off and hang the shower head back on its hook. Of course we had to call for help cleaning up the water and the nurse and the custodial staff member who came said that it was a regular occurrence in that particular room and maintenance couldn't figure out what was causing it because the shower handle was actually being turned on, it wasn't just leaking. They said they had just decided that it must be a ghost. A few days after the incident in the hospital, I went to see my parents and shared the story with them. They reminded me of a somewhat similar thing that happened on a family vacation when I was around 16. This would have been in around 2005 or 2006. We were driving across the US from our home in Wisconsin to visit my mom's side of the family in California, stopping to visit landmarks along the way. It's a 2,000 mile trip and can be boring at times, but there's so much beautiful nature in the center of the country, so I'd highly recommend it. One of the places we visited en route was Yellowstone National Park. We'd stop for the night after a long day of driving at a tiny town about two hours outside the park. It was very isolated and the town's population, if I remember correctly, was less than 200 people and it consisted primarily of a combination post office and restaurant, a school and a motel which is where we stayed. There was also a skeleton-like half-built house on a hill near the motel, which gave off very creepy vibes. The locals said the guy who was building it died suddenly before it was finished, and it had been sitting, abandoned, for more than 10 years. I was already a huge horror and ghost story fan as a teen, so of course my mind started spinning with the idea of the town being haunted. What happened as we settled into our room that night served maybe not as confirmation of a haunting, but it was certainly bizarre. I had turned on the TV and we watched the news for a bit before deciding to go to bed. I pressed the power button on the remote and the screen flickered off, but we could still hear the voice of the news anchor and could see the faint image of the program on the screen. My dad tried the power button on the TV itself. The TV came back on, but when he pressed the button a second time, we could still hear and see the show. We tried muting the TV, turning the channel, changing the brightness, basically everything we could think of, but the voice and the ghostly image remained. Finally, I crawled behind the TV stand and unplugged it, thinking that would do the trick. But we could still hear the voice of the news anchor and could still see the program faintly on the screen. Now, if it had just been the sound of the TV, I would have passed it off as coming from next door but it didn't seem like anyone was staying in that room. And I pressed my ear to the wall to see if I could tell whether the sound was coming through there, and it definitely wasn't. Plus, that wouldn't explain why we could still see the show on the screen. My parents have never really believed in the paranormal, but even they were freaked out, and we obviously still talk about it 16 years later. Honestly, at the time, it didn't necessarily feel paranormal. It was just weird and inexplicable. If anyone has an explanation of how the TV could have remained on after it was unplugged, I'd love to hear it. I know I took photos at the motel and of the creepy house on the hill, but I wasn't able to find them. So I turned to Google and was able to find out a bit more about the town and the house. The town is Wapiti, Wyoming, and the house is called the Smith Mansion. The story of the house is similar to the Winchester Mystery House, in that the man who built it had no real plans for the structure and just continually built onto it haphazardly using whatever wood he could find although in this case he wasn't trying to confuse or ward off any ghosts 
The builder, Francis Lee Smith, did indeed die with the house still under construction. He fell while working on the roof in 1992, after which his son and daughter became the stewards of the house but did not live in it. From what I could tell, the house has remained abandoned for 20 years but was sold in 2020. Just for a little bit of an insight into how my brain works, I had to re-record this story because, uh, not because there's now a giant helicopter flying over my house, so I'm sorry if you can hear that, but I had to re-record this story because when I first read it, I read it as a population with less than 20 people and I was thinking, wow, they have a school and a post office and a hotel and a restaurant for, for a town of less than 20 people and then I was like, does that even constitute a town having less than 20 people? And then I thought, maybe it's less than 200 people. It is, it's 161 people, to be exact, in case you're wondering, because I had to Google it. Also, it's very worthwhile to Google the Smith Mansion. It is a weird looking building. I too would be freaked out by that building. It, it has very Winchester mystery house vibes. It's very strange, kind of higgledy-piggledy. Kind of looks like something from a Tim Burton movie. That is very strange, by the way, to have the TV turn off but still be on. The hospital one is weird too, right? But I know that if you're working in a hospital, I can only presume that lots of things end up going, oh, that's that's just the ghost. I know approximately nothing about the inner workings of a television. But I can only assume that once you plug a television out from the power source, it should not continue to work in any capacity. I think the whole point of the power source is that it gives power to the television. Um, So I don't really know what would cause that. What a strange thing to happen. Such an odd little curiosity. And story number three comes from Lindsay, who is sharing her friend Lid's story. In the summer of 2019, my sister-in-law's family moved from one Massachusetts town to another, upgrading from a small city home to a huge yellow farmhouse. A few months after the big move, my nephews, two and four years old, were excited to have me and my wife over for our first sleepover while their parents were out of town for a wedding. Typically, during our babysitting sleepovers, my wife and I had an understanding that she was on nighttime duty and I was on morning duty. She did the bedtime routine with them and put them to bed. If one or both of the boys awoke in the night, my wife would be in charge of spending time with them until they fell back to sleep. If the boys woke up after 5am, it was my duty to spend time with them and feed them breakfast while my wife slept in. As the nephews got older, it became normal for them to wake up together somewhere around 7am and wait together at our door, so it was expected that I would be getting up with them in the morning. All of the bedrooms were together at the top of the stairs, on the second level of the farmhouse. The nephews shared a room, which was to the left of the guest room where my wife and I slept. Adjacent and to the right of the guest room was the master suite. The entrance to the suite was a hallway containing closets and the original hardwood floor. At the other end of the hallway was the spacious bedroom, bathroom and office space, which were added onto the farmhouse sometime in the 1980s. Early in the morning, asleep in the guest bed, I woke up after hearing a familiar sound come from the boys' room next door. It sounded like one of their sippy cups had fallen off a bed and hit the ground. I checked the time on my phone, and it was just a little after 6am. I didn't feel totally ready to be up for the day, and I hoped that the sound I'd heard didn't wake the boys up so I could get at least another hour of sleep. I shut my eyes and listened for any sign of movement. I heard the sound of their door open, and I prepared to see Nephew standing in our doorway any second. I stayed horizontal and waited. Then I saw what looked like the older Nephew passing by our door and heading straight for the master suite. I heard his footsteps pat on the hardwood floor in the hallway, and then he cried out, Mama? At that point, I knew I had to get myself out of bed because he'd perhaps forgotten that his parents were out of town and it was clearly upsetting. I tossed my sheets off me, got on my feet and walked down the master suite hallway into an empty bedroom. There was no one there. I paused, checked the bathroom and the office and began wondering how it could be possible that my nephew could have exited the room without me seeing. It didn't seem possible. I slowly walked back down the hallway and left the master suite, heading towards the boy's room. The door was ajar. 
I quietly opened the door to find both of them were still in bed and under their covers. I left the room nervously rubbing the back of my head and straining to think about what I had seen and heard just minutes ago. As I walked back into the guest room, I could see that my wife was looking at me. She heard the whole thing too. She asked, Did he not just go into the master? I felt validated by her question. I said, No, they're both still in bed. I just saw a ghost. For the next hour we tried to go back to sleep but my eyes were stuck open. I could not make sense of what we had just experienced. Finally we heard movement in the boys' room and after a minute sure enough saw them both standing in our doorway rubbing their eyes. We told them to hop into bed and snuggle as was routine and they happily climbed up onto our bed. I checked the time and it was exactly 7am. I asked the boys if either of them had woken up early today and left the room and they both said no which was the answer that I expected. The detail that punctuated the whole experience was that the boy that I saw pass the doorway an hour ago was wearing all white. As they snuggled us and we talked about breakfast, I noticed that neither one of my nephews was wearing anything close to white. When their parents arrived home later in the day, I asked if they had had any experiences that seemed ghost-like in the house. My sister-in-law laughed nervously and listed off several times that something strange happened since they moved in. She seems to have accepted the fact that she bought a haunted house, but prefers not to make a big deal of it. The subject didn't come up many times afterwards, but we have learned that our younger nephew has taken up sleepwalking since then. His parents got a camera for the boys' room to observe the sleepwalking. It turns out that on some occasions before the younger one gets out of bed to sleepwalk, the older one sits up in bed and talks to the air at the foot of his bed. Definitely nothing to take too seriously, right? Again, this is a story where you could say, oh, you know, they were probably just dreaming or they were probably just dozing and didn't realise. And then their wife turned around and said, yeah, yeah, no, I heard all that too. So their wife heard the sippy cup falling over and then they heard the child pitter-patter down the hallway and say, mama, while they heard those things but also saw a child walking past the door in white. I mean maybe it is a thing where the spirits of children are attracted to the spirits of other children because of that energy and because of family energy particularly if they're you know in a household with their with small children and parents and maybe they're attracted to that energy. But let me tell you those sleeping monitors, baby monitors that you get for children's rooms where you watch them sleeping, they freak the living shit out of me. My niece has one and she wakes up in the morning and, and like stares straight into the monitor because she knows that it like connects to her parents and she stares straight into the monitor and it's not, she's a cutie and it's not a, a pleasant sight, you know? So if I was looking in the monitor and seeing, <laughs> seeing my kids sitting up talking to something at the foot of his bed and then going back to sleep again. No, no, that monitor would be launched into oblivion. Absolutely not. And strain number four comes from Tori. A few of my experiences which stand out the most involve my career as a hospice nurse. I've worked as a registered nurse for nearly 17 years, 10 of which have been dedicated to the hospice care and end of life care. I've witnessed hundreds of deaths in patients' homes and in our inpatient unit where patients are brought in for symptom management needs that require 24-hour care. My first story happened when I was working the night shift in the community. Hospice nurses who work the community at night typically respond to crisis visits, uncontrolled symptoms such as pain or difficulty breathing, or patient deaths, where we listen for a patient's heartbeat and respirations to determine if a death has occurred before calling a doctor for a death pronouncement. This particular visit was for a call in which the patient had reported chest pain to our triage nurse at around midnight, who dispatched me out to the home. This wasn't an unusual visit for me. I was used to driving around our service area in the dark, trying to squint through my windshield to find the correct house number so that I didn't startle the occupants of the wrong residence. This particular neighbourhood was really nice, with big brick homes set back from the street, each with large, well-kept lawns. I found the correct house number, then parked my car and grabbed my gear bag before walking up the path to the front door. As I went to knock on the front door, I suddenly started to feel uneasy. 
as if I was being watched. I checked my surroundings for safety but didn't see anything that would explain this feeling, so I brushed it off as just being overly tired. At the time this occurred, my youngest daughter was only around seven months old, so I hadn't been sleeping well during the day due to my husband and I working opposite shifts to save money on childcare. The elderly gentleman that I was visiting answered the door and let me into his home, where I performed my examination and provided medications for his symptoms. While we were talking, I could hear movement down the hall which sounded like shuffling and things being moved, and noticed that the light down the hall would occasionally flicker as if there was a short in the electricity. Assuming that he had a spouse or a caretaker living with him that might also need to know about the care that I was providing, I asked who else was with him. I was stunned when he looked at me dead in the eyes and said, That's just my wife. She's been dead a few years, but she still likes to let people know she's around. She's always moving things in the front bedroom where she used to sleep, and she likes to mess with the lights in the house. It was at this point that I noticed the lamp behind the patient was also starting to dim and then brighten in a pattern. Dim, then bright. Dim, then bright. I quickly wrapped up the visit, told him that his primary team would follow up in the morning and noped right on out of there. I've also had several experiences in our inpatient unit, which has had, and I wish I were exaggerating, thousands of deaths in the time that it has been opened. Room 244 is rumoured by a medium who was visiting a loved one to have a portal for the dead. And when room 246 is empty, the linen closet doors will slam open and shut and the patient call button will activate repeatedly unless staff go down there, turn on the television and reassure the empty room that they will be in occasionally to check on things. Two of my most memorable experiences actually don't involve either of these rooms. Before I share the first inpatient unit story, I have to provide a few details so that the event makes more sense. Each room on the inpatient unit is private and is set up like a nice hotel, with ornate wood trim on the ceilings and beautiful furnishings. Each room contains a hospital bed, a pull-out sofa for loved ones to sleep on, a full bath with a walk-in shower, a wardrobe closet that contains a mini fridge, and patio doors which open onto a private balcony large enough for visiting as well as for wheeling hospital beds out on to let patients get the fresh air. Every night at shift change, staff go around to each of the rooms with a master key and lock the patio doors for safety, which also activates an alarm system that triggers a few warning beeps to let staff at the nurse's station know that the doors are being locked. One more thing that is important to note is that we never fully close the doors to a patient's room unless a family member is present for safety reasons, since most of our patients are a high fall risk. Patients who are alone in their rooms always have their doors partially ajar, and the wall switch that activates a built-in nightlight is kept on to reduce the chances of a nighttime fall. I want to say it was around 2am on this night and we had a full house. Room 226 was actively dying, and had been unresponsive for a few days. As far as I knew, he hadn't had any visitors, so I was startled when the patio door alarm sounded at the nurse's station. I looked up to see that it was room 226, and as I went over to the room to investigate, my heart sank when I saw the door to his room was completely closed. There was no reason why that door should have been completely closed. I opened the door and was hit with a blast of cold air, and it took my eyes a moment to adjust because the room was completely dark. I mean pitch black. No nightlight, no bathroom light, not a single light was on. I looked over to see the patio doors were wide open. Thinking that maybe someone had broken in, I quickly checked the room, the bathroom and the surrounding patio. But no one was there other than this unresponsive, dying patient. The room was absolutely still. I couldn't explain any of it. Later on that night, I heard a tab alarm activate which happens when a fall patient attempts to get up from a chair without assistance, pulling a magnetic tab with them to activate an alarm. I searched every room and couldn't figure out where the alarm sound was coming from. Then I reached room 226, and again, to my shock, I could hear the alarm. It was coming from the ceiling vent inside the room. The sound stopped shortly after I figured out where it was coming from, and I have no explanation for it. 
there was definitely not a tab alarm sitting in the ceiling and every other patient on the unit was sound asleep. My second inpatient experience involves a younger woman who was dying from complications of long-standing drug and alcohol abuse. Before she transitioned into actively dying, she would comment about hallucinations she was seeing in the room. A young boy who would run around the room and hide under one of the tables. A man who would occasionally talk to her. And most frighteningly of all, a huge creature that resembled a growling black dog that would absolutely terrify her. We would always attribute her visions to hallucinations. But after this night, there were a few of us who weren't so sure. She stayed with us for weeks before transitioning, and staff developed a bond with her. Once she became unresponsive, we would take turns at night going in to sit with her, when we had a free time because she didn't have any visitors. One night, I had some downtime, and decided to go sit with her for a little while. But as I went to sit on the chair next to her bed, I noticed that the chair and the area immediately around the chair was freezing cold. I thought that this was really odd, but I went to check the thermostat to make sure someone hadn't turned down the temperature in the room. The temperature was set to the usual 70 degrees, and it was at this point that I noticed that the rest of the room felt normal. I brushed it off as my imagination, since I'm usually cold anyway and I went to sit on the other side of the bed. Shortly after this, a co-worker came into the room to sit with me, and she also commented how cold that spot was to sit in before moving away from the spot. The comment made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I walked over to the chair and stuck my hand into the empty space. Ice. Freaking. Cold. So cold the hairs on my arm were standing up. As soon as I pulled my hand away from the space where this chair was, the temperature of the room felt normal again. Another staff member came to do her hourly room rounding while my other co-worker and I were standing there trying to find a cause. And without telling her why, I asked her to go sit in the chair next to the bed. As soon as she sat down, she complained about how cold it was in the spot and jumped right back up out of the chair. The weird thing was, as we were moving our hands around to find the temperature differences, it always seemed to dissipate at the height and width of where an average sized adult would be sitting in that chair. We all decided that someone must have been holding vigil at her bedside, just like we had been, to make sure she didn't die alone, hopefully protecting her from the dog-like creature she had seen previously. She passed away the next day. I have a ton of unexplained experiences both in my personal and professional life, but these were just a few that I wanted to share from my time working in hospice. First of all, I just have to say that people who work in hospice care are incredible. I don't know if I could manage working in an environment where people are dying all the time. And I understand that it is what you're trained for. It's something you get used to. It is a fact of life that people die. And at least people like that woman in your last story who didn't have any visitors didn't die alone. They died with people who were looking out for them, people who'd come and sit and have a chat with them. And I just think it's such an incredible job to do. Um, made even more incredible by the fact that apparently everybody who works in hospice experiences ghost stuff all the time. Because <laughs> hospice care stories always give me the heebie-jeebies. Always. Especially that one with the sound coming from the vent. Oh, that made the hairs on my arms stand on end. Coming from the vent. Whatever, if it was just the chair, you could say, oh, the chair is malfunctioned. There is nothing, no, those patients... Those dying people aren't climbing into the vents, okay? Those vents don't need magnetic alarm systems. So how in the heck was that sound coming from the vent? It's got, it's given me Kimberly's story. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Remember, the last story came from the 24th of January, 2022. Thank you to Mark, Katie, Lindsay and Tori for sending in your stories. And remember, if you would like to learn anything about Real Life Ghost Stories podcast, you can do so by checking out reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are super desperate for more content, you can access more content by subscribing to patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories, where for $5 a month and $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content and every single episode, mini and main episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time.
At Kroger, we want our fresh produce to meet your expectations, which is why we're dedicated to doing up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies, checking for things like scarring. In fact, only the best produce, like zesty oranges and crisp carrots, reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh, our higher standards mean fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. If you're looking to get a new car, you could really cut expenses by bundling your car and renter's insurance with Progressive. Sure, you love your old car, but you know it's not normal to give instructions on how to open the window. It should be self-explanatory, but it's not. And notice how when you're in other people's cars, you can feel cushion in the seats? That's pretty nice, right? No, it's just normal. So bundle your renters and car insurance with Progressive and put the savings toward a new car. It's time. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers.